Okay, this is the last part. This is suitability modding, modeling part four. This is just basically, um, you know, showing you how you can piece together that uh, last bit of information to make some maps. I'm going to call them bad maps because I'm not going to spend a lot of time today making my maps perfect. I'm going to show you what a, you know, 10 or 15 minute worth of work can look like. And then you have to decide how much better um, you need to make your maps. Realizing that at 10 or 15 minutes you're not going to uh, win any uh, points for creativity or awesome map making skills. So um, keep that in mind and we will proceed. So um, who to build a suitability model? This is a very important lesson right here because it should be how to build a suitability model, a basic suitability model. When you're finishing up a project like this, proofreading, spell checking, grammar checking, these are all important things. Things that I struggle with personally and things that many students do as well. Um, so I could have fixed this or I could have left it like this to point out that these are the sort of things that you may not think about, but actually they make the difference between having a really good product in the end or having something that's just, well, ordinary. All right, so we're in the stage now getting uh, generating knowledge. So let's look at how that plays out. Finishing up uh, the making of bad maps and other such things really comes down to asking yourself a series of questions as you start this process. Uh, things like what's new, what is important or informational in terms of what you're going uh, to show, what you've uh, made. Think about that answer that you have to convey, the, the question that was asked and how you're going to answer it. Uh, how many maps do you need? Um, what are you going to map? Are you going to stay in raster? Are you going to switch to vector? What about tables? Do you need tables? Are tables necessary? We'll look at all these things. The uh, first three actually lump together pretty nicely. What's new? What's important? What's informational? What answer are you trying to um, convey? They all kind of come down to the same sort of things. Now that we've done all of our GIS work, we know where the habitat is. So obviously we need a map of the habitat to sort of show where this answer to this question is. We also could use maps of inputs, and the reason is that can help people understand how you got to the answer. When you show the inputs and explain how they go together and what the model itself is, it usually makes a lot more sense. Uh, our question is about how much habitat there is in West Virginia, which is a most basic question we can ask. So um, now that we know how much habitat there is, how are we going to convey that? Now we can visually show that, but numerically speaking, um, the best way to do that is probably with a table. So we'll look at that. Tables aren't complicated. They're easy. And lastly, um, style considerations. Color, black and white. Goes back to a lot of the stuff that we covered in the cartography chapters. Audience, format, what kind of printer, how they're going to read it, how you're going to show it. All this kind of goes in. Turns out for a most general of purposes, something that's in a simple grayscale color actually works pretty good for just about anything. It's easy to read, it's easy to print, it shows up nice overhead. Um, as long as you don't have too many uh, classes of, of um, things, it, it actually is pretty nice. So we'll look at some of these options. So how many maps, maps of what? Should we stay in raster or switch to vector? And then tables. Well, I'm thinking three maps. Maybe two. I mean, you could maybe show the habitat, the land cover, and the elevation together, but you'd have to probably go into vector because you'd need to display it a little differently, not just in colors. You'd probably have to use something like a, uh, a hatched ground, uh, a foreground that would go over top of a darker background for one or the other so that you could see where they were overlapping. Um, I don't know. We'll take a look and see. As far as maps... Uh, we're going to make simple choropleth maps, nothing fancy, okay, just basic, foolproof, you know, 
you could, uh, those of you who've watched the Tiger King oh, on Netflix, um, you could make a map here that Joe's favorite tigers could read, okay? These are maps that are not going to tax your mental faculties. These are, oh yeah, that's habitat, because it says this is habitat, and that's where it's at, it makes sense, done. Uh, we're going to take a look here and try both of these a little bit. Um, we'll start through making uh, some vector stuff from my sort of more advanced um, model that I've been carrying along with as we go here. Uh, just for the purposes of showing you how to make the conversion. And then at that point in time, I'll make a decision whether that's something we're going to proceed with or not. And if it's not, we'll go over to the... Um, uh, just uh, doing the student model in raster and finish everything up. Um, so, um, why would we want to um, add tables? Well, are we going to add tables? Yeah, yeah. It's it's simply too easy um, to provide that vital information in the format of a table. Tables will work well in your report, and they work well in posters. So definitely we're going to do tables. So we're, so we're going to make a checklist before we get started. We're going to clean up our map and, and sort of eliminate things that are messy and in the way and get ready. We'll try the, rest, the vector and raster thing and make a decision on that. We'll try to use a more sensible color schemes and not anything too outlandish. We're going to use one layout. This is important. Um, I'm going to show you a technique to where you can make multiple maps and they'll look identical except the content will be different. And the layout and the positioning and the scale and all that stuff will be uh, pretty much constant. And that will make your maps a lot, um, uh, let's just say that if you have a tendency to uh, experience um, obsessive compulsive angst uh, when looking at stuff that is... Uh, made entirely all different and doesn't line up and it's like it's from soup to nuts in terms of who did it how uh, if you like things to be ordered and concise and similar and follow you know reasonable patterns then uh, this is an important sort of thing to do um, so we're going to do that we're also going to learn how to make tables and we're going to learn how to make posters so we'll start out by uh, acquiring a outline of the state. This is a, something we can actually use. You can go back to the tech center. Uh, you, you see the web address up there at the top. Um, uh, it's the same place we've been looking before. <clears throat> I found it by going into GIS data and looking for boundaries. Uh, and I like this one because it's got an option to download the state outline in UTM NAT83, which is what we're already working in. Okay, so this is my sort of cleaned up um, map. This is the one uh, that I made. This is the one that has all the uh, uh, bells and whistles, if you will. It's a true, more, more of a true index model. And I classified it out into four categories of, of uh, potential habitat. I'm going to add in my state parks or my state boundary layer. And so my state boundary layer was simple. I downloaded it into my data one folder. I then exported everything and unzipped everything from the zip file into my data2 file and here it is and now I'm going to add it into my map uh, right off the bat I can tell you this is a horrible color scheme um, actually though I kind of like it which is all the more reason to know it's probably not a good scheme uh, I did drag my West Virginia state boundary all the way to the bottom because I want it to display behind my layers and if you look up there on the top left where it says table of contents underneath the table of contents there's little icons for how things are displayed in the table of contents the first one is drawing order and so if that is the one that's selected then the thing that's at the top of the list shows up on the top layer the things that's on the bottom list show up on the bottom layer by sliding the state boundaries to the bottom of this table of contents then they're underneath otherwise the default is it adds it to the top in which case you wouldn't be able to see anything So the, one of the first things I did was I wanted to reclassify this again and, and convert it over um, into just the numeric values for the purposes of uh, my conversion from uh, raster into vector. And that meant I was going to have to exclude the zeros because I don't want a whole bunch of polygons wasting time and space. So I went through this classification process. 
I use the Jinx Natural Brakes because that voids me of any sort of, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, any sort of uh, malice or planning on my part to try to convey a certain answer. I knew the zeros weren't important because it was not habitat, and so I clicked on that exclusion button, and that's when I got the one there on the left of the, that exclusion properties window. I input a zero, I selected four classes, and it chose the breaking points, and then I ran it. Now, as soon as I did that, it gave me an option to obviously then uh, do some other things, and I did. I changed the old values to new simple numeric values. The lowest scores got a value of 1, the next level 2, the next level 3, and the next level 4. So I now have a simple numeric uh, code instead of uh, those lengthy um, names that I had typed in or these uh, decimal values that you see here. Just real simple things. And then I selected the box at the bottom to change my missing values to no data, which is always a good idea. And... Um, Gave it a name and stuck it in a folder where I know it was going to be by adjusting my raster output. And then clicked OK. And next I ran the majority filter tool. Now, if you remember, majority filter looks at this window and it looks at the values that's there and calculates a new value for a cell based on that. And so the idea is if I've only got one little cell of habitat, it's not going to count. It's going to make it not habitat. If I've got more than four of something, um, it will. And so it's going to go through and kind of weed out some of these other areas and make them into uh, what I want. In other words, I'm trying to eliminate small isolated pockets of habitat uh, in any of the classes that really isn't, um, it's an anomaly. It's got to be, you know, enough of a, ones in a group there to make a difference. So after I ran that, you can see that I've got a very different look here. And that there's um, some of that four, which is the bad habitat, but I actually got rid of quite a lot of that. Um, then there's the three. The three is just, you know... Uh, not great, but sort of okay. Uh, and there's a lot of that. And then the two, which is more towards the better habitat, yeah, there's plenty of that. But then that dark green, just not much of that at all. So the next thing I wanted to do was to convert that into polygons. And so if you look over on the right, under Conversion Tools in the Arc Toolbox, I went down and found the From Raster Toolbox, and in that I found Raster to Polygon. This will take my rasters and convert it into polygons. Um, I inputted the raster that I wanted. I selected the variable that I needed as far as the field, which was the value. I told it to simplify polygons, and I checked the box that says Create Multi-Part Features. And the reason is I don't want 10,000 polygons. I want a polygon for category 1, a polygon for category 2, a polygon for category 3, and a polygon for category 4. That way I can go in and calculate up the areas of each of those individually and I don't have to do anything fancy to get the right numbers in the end. So once I made these selections in here, I simply uh, selected OK and continued. And the first thing I noticed was it popped up like this because it showed it just as one variable. And that means that before I can do anything with this, with this I'm going to have to go into the properties uh, and the symbology and reconfigure how it's displaying my new polygons. So I went in and the field value that I'm going to be using is now called the grid code. And I have grid codes 1 through 4 and then I gave a... Uh, a text label to each of those, worst, poor, good, and best. And mapped it out. And I tinkered with the color schemes here. Turns out I spent quite a lot of time trying to get to where I could see this. I turned boundary uh, borders off. I reconfigured the order that things were displayed and tried different color schemes. And it really never looked very good. Um, it just... Uh, you couldn't make out much uh, detail 
which was kind of the point of this model was to show that there is some detail so if i was looking at a specific county then maybe this would be a really good thing to do but looking at it from the whole state i'm just not sure so the conversion seems to be a bad idea the colors are hard to see it's not a great deal of benefit it's a lot of extra steps so i'm just going to stick with the raster format because it's easier and um, while it may be a counterintuitive because you know you're always academically it seems rewarded for doing the harder and the complicated um, in GIS what you need to do is what's better and better has a lot of definitions better can be faster better can be simpler better can be easier as long as better means that you're producing a better product that is better for the end users to understand and so if there's no value of making it into vector uh, for the people who in the, at the end of the day are looking at your maps what's the point uh, to show that you can run another tool that you can do something else um, you need to know how to do that but that doesn't make it a better product and so we'll stick with the raster because it's obviously a better choice in this instance okay so let's look at the student model that's what you guys really want to see anyway and we'll go through that process of uh, converting it into uh, some final products. So, um, started off with uh, just one of my inputs, which is my student elevation layer, where I classified it between, uh, you know, above 900 and below, uh, zeros and ones. Nice and simple map, pretty straightforward, uh, no big complicated issues there. But I want to look at a lot of this stuff in map view, not just in layout, or layout view, not just data view. So let's examine what that looks like. And so uh, sort of about a third of the way across the screen along the bottom, there's a couple little windows. One is data view, the next one is layout view, and then there's sort of a refresh and a pause button. And so by going into the layout view, it gives me what my map product will look like in the end. And when I first did this, it gave it to me in portrait. If you go up to file and uh, down to print properties, I think it is, you can change this. You can go in and make it, um, uh, what do you call it, um, landscape. Uh, I also done a couple other things here. You can see I changed uh, my zeros to under 900 meters and my ones to over 900 meters. And then I just basically went about the business of making a map. I resized my image of West Virginia to fit in my landscape. I used the hand tool, which is up there beside the plus and minus glasses, uh, to drag the state around until I got it in the spot. I added in my scale bar. I added in my, um, uh, my legend. I did all those things that you've done in those chapters making maps. And if you're not sure how to do it, Go back in your textbook and look. Go back in the slides and look. I'm not going to go through every step. I just pointed out that I had those things in here. I also added a text box where I put in uh, who the map was by, uh, where the data came from, and all that kind of stuff, and gave it uh, a title. So uh, one of the mistakes students make a lot is once they finish a map like that, they just take a screenshot of that. That's a horrible way to do it. Uh, you need to export your map and you can simply go over to file and go down to export uh, map and um, uh, pick a spot to save it select the format I usually use JPEG in this option you see I raised the resolution up to 400 um, because I, I want a, a higher quality because I'm going to make this bigger in my uh, poster when you do that, you get something that looks just like this. This is the JPEG image of my map, and this is what my map looks like. This is a map, okay? <clears throat> the other is a map document in ArcGIS, or it's a particular screen in there, but it's not a map. This is a map. And um, you can see over here to the right, it's in my folders, and there it is, student elevation map. It's a JPEG and that's all there is to it now um, what I did next is kind of clever I like that format I don't want to have to try to replace the 
scale bar and the title box and resize the state, I want to keep it all the same. Especially for these first two, because these first two, turns out, are just two parts of my model. And so all I did was, after I printed off my map, I, I went back, or ex after I exported my map, I didn't actually print it. I went back in, I unchecked my student elevation data layer and checked my new gap, which is my um, layer for my uh, various uh, land covers. And I went in and started fixing those things in my map. And the first thing I did was I worked on my legend. Simply clicked on it, and you, once you click on it, you get that dashed blue line along the edges. I then right-clicked and went to Properties, and the first thing I did was I changed the title of it because it's no longer Elevation Ranges, it's now Land Cover. Uh, below that, you see the various input layers. Uh, if it's on the right and you click on it and you click the arrow in between those two boxes that points to the left, it takes it back out of the legend. If it's in your table of contents and you want to add it into the legend, you find it under those map layers, like New Gap. Click on it. Click the arrow that points to the right, it'll add it in. So I, uh, I did that, and so now it says land cover because I changed the title, and it's got those um, two different classes, which are also not the same names that you see before. And if you look up there, you notice in the table of contents, I deleted out the, the uh, title of it and some other stuff. If unnecessary text starts showing up in your uh, legend, and this happens a lot when you do this, you know, sort of uh, the way I'm doing it here. <clears throat> Rather than trying to figure out how to get rid of it in the legend, if you just, you know, do a slow double click so that the text becomes editable and then you hit delete so there's nothing there, it'll automatically resize and remove and fix it over here. Now, um, I also had to go in and change the text box uh, because it's no longer elevation data. It's now from the gap analysis project. And we can move on. Again, fix that. Fix that. Oops. Did not change that. That should now be what? Something about land covers. So here we go, land covers. And uh, just so if you're not quite sure how to export the map, if you go up and click on File and go down to Export Map, that's uh, how it works. All right. Okay, uh, so what's next? Well, I've got two maps made. I want to use that same map view to keep things to match, I think. Um, one color scheme is okay. The other one was really bad. So if you're going to, you, you know, um, you'd obviously want to make sure that you had the right color scheme you wanted before you continued. Uh, because once you export that map, basically what you're saying is you're done with that phase. And that horrible green and purple map is just not done by any stretch. So we're going to combine those two data layers, make a habitat map, and we'll look at the tables after that. All right, so um, went through that whole process of creating the habitat model, just like we did in the last video, where I've got ones and zeros. And I right-clicked and went to my properties and my symbology so I could make some changes. And I simply selected the little color box uh, there on the left inside the uh, thing. Uh, and I can make the zeros white and the ones sort of a dark gray, or I can make the zeros no color. Or you can right click on the zeros and click where it says remove underneath that center box and whatever is highlighted. So right now one is highlighted. If I was to click remove, it would just take it out of the display. It wouldn't even look at it. And the only thing you have is the zeros. Well, I'm going to remove the zeros because I want the ones. Another important thing here is those counts. This is a cool place to go in and get your counts to see how much habitat you have and how much not habitat you have. So once I ran it, uh, I made the zeros um, basically invisible and I made the ones uh, a dark gray and then I made the state background layer that we downloaded a, a while ago a, a, a light gray and this is what you get. And this really doesn't look like much. I flipped over from the data view to the layout view. Remember, bottom of the screen next to the refresh and the pause buttons, there's two little icons there that you can click. One's data view, one's layout view. One is just the data, one is the data on a map window like this. Uh, and I went about, again, 
correcting and fixing some of this stuff where it was land cover and all these different things I had to make some changes so again if you right click on land cover you can go down to properties properties comes open so um, once uh, the legend properties uh, pop up you can move other things in and out of the legend as you need you can give it titles if you want or in this case I uncheck the box up there to show the title and then deleted the text out of the box because I don't want a title and it'll make sense why here in a minute I went into my layer properties I removed the zero layer like I had talked about doing earlier and then I added a label to the one layer calling it flying squirrel habitat now after going through all that trouble of preserving um, that I tried to make the uh, habitat bigger by uh, switching to my magnify glass tool and making uh, zooming in on just the areas where the habitat was and then can, switching over to that hand grab tool so that I could shift it around inside my map document and then I refit my text and my other things I had to change my text box because this isn't data that came from someplace else this is data that I created and so uh, I just put the map was by me I could have added you know all kinds of things and constraints and where it could go and who could use it and that sort of stuff but I chose not to um, uh, we know that the darker colors are the modeled habitat so that's what I called it and I didn't really think since it's just the one like that there wasn't really a need to, for, to, for a title for the legend and that kind of stuff that did enable me to make that a little bit bigger um, but after I resized West Virginia I really don't like this map um, at all I think um, this is one of those situations where you probably need to uh, keep the format that we had for the other two maps and not zoom around like I did or um, do that make uh, West Virginia smaller and then zoom in and do an insert another data layer of this area and zoom in on the habitat much closer there are lots of little tricks you can do cartographically and um, those are the kind of things that get rewarded um, stylistically as far as you know what you're doing but uh, I'm not gonna uh, lose too much sleep over in this uh, demonstration here um, and this is also another good time to point out um, when you go to print off your maps it's always good to make one last crack to make sure that you've got your spell checked and whatnot uh, because you don't want people to spend too much time worrying about what a flitting squirrel habitat map is instead of a flying squirrel habitat map the next step in the process is basically how to make a poster in PowerPoint if you're familiar using other software to make posters and you want to do it that way that's fine uh, but what I'm going to show you here is really a simple way to do it we're going to resize the slide we're going to add some guides make some text boxes and then just fit stuff in it's really not that complicated okay so let's uh, take a look at um, how we go about making um, a poster in PowerPoint the first thing we're going to do is take a single slide in a brand new PowerPoint document <clears throat> and we're going to resize it and the way we do that is by going under the design tab and then going across to the slide size and they have some standard sizes we want to go to the custom slide size and then we're going to put in whatever size we want I'm going to choose 24 inches tall 36 inches wide so that's a 2 by 3 a 3 by 4 would also work but a 2 by 3 is a pretty good size for what we're doing and looking at it and then click OK and then it really doesn't look any different but now it is much different and so the next sort of step is we need to add these guides guides are really helpful and again under the view tab okay um, under show there's rulers grid lines and guides grid lines are just uh, like a grid uh, and they work but guides are interesting because you can move them around and the way you move them around is you simply click on it and then while you've clicked on it hit the control button and then drag your mouse and wherever you want to drop the line at you let go of the mouse and it puts the new line there now if you just want to move a line you don't hit the control you just mouse over top of it until it 
it identifies and then you can click on it and drag it and move it as it's moving it shows the numbers and that's its position relative to center and so if our poster is 24 inches tall then we know that from that middle line that goes across it's 12 inches to the top and 12 inches to the bottom and so as you drag that line up or make a new line and go up it will tell you um, where it's at whether it's at 1, 2, 10, 11 and a half inches. Same way with the, the line that goes up and down the middle from side to side. This post is 36 inches wide, so that's 18 inches on either side. And so then you can add some lines in. The, the key ones to add in are the borders for the right and left outside edge, the bottom border, and then the top, um, across the top, you want to create a border where your title, bottom of your title box is going to be. And so mine are sort of looks kind of like this. So I put my side boundaries, my bottom boundary, my top boundary where I'm going to put my text for my title. And then uh, I created two columns, one on each side for text and things. And that left me this big square in the middle, which I then divided up evenly uh, with those two lines so that I now have four windows. That's enough for three maps and one table. So my next step was to go to one of the uh, two columns and add in um, a text box that fits to the edges of that uh, column and uh, and then the size I increased until it looked to where it was readable based on the size of this document which turned out to be about size 40 font um, did the same thing on the other side and you can see how I have an introduction I have some methods I have some data I have some results and conclusions and references uh, all this stuff is put in there. I would then add the text to it. I could change it around. I could uh, do different things. I could go maybe not bulleted points. Maybe I want to write paragraphs. Maybe I need to use bigger font for my titles like introduction and methods and then smaller font for the other things. This is all stuff you can figure out. Uh, next step after this was to go up to the insert tab and I selected that I wanted to insert a picture and then I had to go to the um, my uh, folder where I'd exported all those maps and I simply selected those three JPEGs and when it added them all in I then drug them around and you can see they're just a little bit too big and so what happens most of the time is students will select one map like in this example here that one in the upper right hand corner is selected and they'll resize it and they'll try to resize all the others and get them the same if you click on one map and hold I believe it's the shift key and then select another map and then another map till eventually all three are selected you can then grab one of those little round corner point markers and drag it inward and that will uh, keep the aspect ratio in check and it makes the map smaller it also makes the other two maps smaller as well and so I did that and I made these maps a little bit smaller and then after that I clicked somewhere off so that they were no longer selected and I could move them around individually and place them however I want and I added another text box across the top to put in my title, made the font bigger, and that's pretty much it. Um, now, I have a big hole there where I need to put in my table, but like I showed you earlier, uh, you can create the table in here or you can do it in Word. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, and so we'll take a quick look at some of that. Uh, um, but otherwise, uh, I guess I didn't show you earlier, but you're going you're gonna to see. Uh, you can uh, go up here and... and create your uh, uh, your table right here in um, PowerPoint make it look the way it needs to be once you do that maybe you move these around a little bit maybe you move the, the elevations underneath the land cover and you move the flying squirrel habitat up to the top maybe you decide hey that should be in landscape or maybe it should be in portrait so you go back to your map document you make a new map you make it in portrait you size it up so it doesn't look identical to these two but you can make it a little bit wider and a little bit taller and show a little bit more and then you can have a smaller table these are you know a lot of ways you can change this stuff around uh, this is up to you uh, as students to figure out now, I want to point out something notice the, the space underneath of each of these maps in the middle that would be a handy little spot to add a little tiny text box that would explain specifically about that map it's also a place where you definitely need to add a text box and identify this is map one this is map two this is map three this is table one or something like that um, depending on how you want to reference them in your text but ultimately 
Um, you're going to take elements that uh, you can do it one of two ways. You can take stuff from your final report if you get it done in time or get done early to where you can um, um, condense it, if you will, and, and use it in these text box on this page. Or uh, you can create basically like an outline of what you want to talk about. Uh, in your report and use that outline here to make bulleted points so like under introduction you can make four or five points like was endangered uh, critical habitat limited uh, range uh, it's protected by the whatever law you know that kind of stuff and under methods you could talk about um, uh, digital elevation models and land uh, classification data sets and reclassifying uh, data and uh, map algebra and things like that under data you can talk about the different data sets and where they came from the projections you know any number of things what did you find out uh, you can go back and and look at those number of cells and figure out the percentage of land cover or the percentage of elevate of land that's over that elevation there's lots of results to be had in, um, in what you're doing and same way with your flying, or in this case, your flitting squirrel uh, habitat. You can, you know, really think about that. This also brings up another point. It's not just flying squirrels. It's not just West Virginia flying squirrels. It's a very specific species. It's the northern West Virginia flying squirrel. Uh, there's a southern uh, flying squirrel that competes uh, sometimes with it. Uh, and so you need to make sure that you have the same nomenclature that you use in terms of individual maps, in terms of your poster, in terms of your introduction, your methods, your data, your results, your conclusions, uh, references. Put in references what, where, the, where the data came from. Doesn't have to be super elaborate, just what it is, where it was, the web link. Um, and remember, none of this data, okay, is referenced to the West Virginia GIS Tech Center, okay? That's where you downloaded it from. The elevation data come from USGS, part of the National Elevation Data Set. The land cover came from the West Virginia Gap Analysis, and there's all kinds of stuff on the on those web pages for that. You don't have to have everything perfect um, as far as that kind of stuff goes for this, but you you'll have time, and you need to use that time to make it more perfect for your um, reports when they're due, and um, what I'm going to do, and, and I'll talk more about that uh, in class this week, I'll give you the definitive uh, drop-dead cutoff date for when I have to have everything. Um, but uh, otherwise, we're in pretty good shape. So I uh, just wanted to um, congratulate everyone if you've got to this point. Uh, you're well on your way to creating your first uh, suitability model and a poster that can demonstrate not only where that model shows that habitat's at but maybe uh, depending on what your question is you can uh, do a little more and we'll uh, zoom in class tonight so that we can talk about it in, in more detail for any specific steps that each of you might have for the way that uh, you're doing a little bit different from this but overall um, this is the model so to make a table in word uh, you can make it in word or you can make it in um, the uh, PowerPoint. It's really not hard. Uh, in fact, it's quite simple. Uh, there's an insert function where you can create a table. What you want to do, though, is just remember this. You need to figure out how many columns and rows you need. And don't forget about the titles or the labels that go at the top of each section. And we're going to start out making all the borders of all the lines black so that we can see everything is and lines up. But ultimately, tables should not look like that. They should look like the thing below. You should have a line that separates the labels from the individual data. And that should be about it. And so in this example here, it should look more like the bottom one. Now, if you wanted to get nitpicky, I could resize those text boxes so that they fit a little tighter. But otherwise, that's basically what you're looking for. Now, how to do this? Well, you got to go into the... Um, uh, basically into the insert and add a text box and you just make it and then once you've done that under design you have some effect and control over it so you can select it 
and change the borders. If you select the whole thing, the borders that you're selecting goes to that. If you select one row or one column, you can change the borders just to that. Um, same way with you know the font and the text and other things. Uh, you should be able to figure that out without too much difficulty.